Hi everyone! Can you hear me? <laughs> My name is Charmaine Siagian and welcome to Hal Leonard's second educational piano webinar. We are webcasting from, well I am, from cold and icy Milwaukee and I hope everyone's doing okay and hanging in there and maybe some of you have palm trees out your window. So <laughs> um, today's webinar features publications from Willis Music a publisher that has been around since 1899 and that we have a wonderful partnership with. Um, today it's a family owned company and its CEO is Kevin Cranley. Um, Willis really was the foremost publisher in the early part of the 20th century. And with, with names like Gillock, A Dozen a Day, John Thompson, um, and a huge names like that that really still sells really well around the world. And, but of course, now we have names like, you know, Glenda Austin, Eric Baumgartner, Carolyn Miller, Randall Hartzell, Naoko Ikeda, uh, Carolyn Satliff, and our presenter today, Jason Sifford, Dr. Jason Sifford, <laughs> who is um, 300 miles away from us in Iowa. And he has been a composer and arranger with Willis for over two years now. We were really thrilled when he signed on because he kind of is one of those musicians that is annoyingly good at everything <laughs> um, in every genre, every you know. But most importantly, he's a fantastic teacher. So we're really happy to have him here today. Okay, so I think I covered everything, um, and I won't waste any more time. So without further ado, here is Jason Sifford. Well, thanks for having me. Um, gosh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's still strange. It's getting less strange after 10 months of this, but I'm glad to see everybody here. I can see you in the chat, lots of people I know and people I who are new. And anyway, it's really fun to see you all here. Um, I will do my best. I was telling Amy before we started, I have a little trick to remind myself to look at the camera. I do this with my students. It's because I have a monkey. This is the monkey. And I put the monkey by the camera because I find that it's a little less awkward to talk to the monkey instead of talking to the camera. But every now and then I'll probably look over here or look over there. But just one of those online teaching things I thought might be helpful. There are also some handouts. Um, if you download them and look at them, they won't make any sense until I sort of get to them later. But uh, hopefully you'll find them helpful. And then, uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions in the chat and we'll do those at the end. Um, I'm going to talk through some music. So let's see, this, this is my teaching studio here at home. This is what my students have been looking at uh, for a while. I uh, thought we'd start with a couple of collections that I wrote. Uh, the most recent one that I wrote is called Weightless. And it's a bunch of pieces that are um, based on, you know, outer space themes. Uh, I couldn't do the planets because Holst already did that. So my outer space phenomena are a little bit different. The first piece in the book, and this is just a little bit of a window into like why I write the pieces in the way that I do. The first piece in the book is Takata Rocket, and it's first for a reason. It's a piece that I kind of envisioned as like a festival or recital opener. Um, I always try to put myself in sort of my student's shoes. And so, you know, imagine that you're like at a festival or, you know, some kind of thing where you have to like sit and get cold for a while in a hallway waiting for your turn. And then you have to, you know, walk in and play cold. And it happens so often, you know, students will rate their turn in recitals. And so I wrote this with the idea that it would be a really nice piece that's both flashy and fun to play, but also really comfortable to begin with. And so if you look at how uh, it's organized, the hands never play at the same time in the very beginning. Uh, so you don't have to deal with any like weird coordination. So the rhythm is just left, right, right, left, right, right, left, right. And so you kind of have that groove. And then playing the fifth in the left hand and the second in the right hand kind of gives you a pretty comfortable um, really comfortable beginning. Uh, you know, it's not like, you know, starting Ravel on Dean or something where you're kind of on pins and needles getting ready. Um, 
another thing I like is that, you know, as you get going in the piece, there are a couple of um, uh, like hand crossings that get the arms moving. And then by the time you get to the middle and the end of the piece, I feel like you're really warmed up and feel really confident in your uh, recital situation. The other thing I did in the piece is that the B section, I wanted an opportunity to teach theory in a piece. And I wanted to be able to work on triads and inversions in kind of a nice and easy way. So I'll show you kind of what I might do with students. And let's see, if we can get me back to full screen, I'm gonna share some stuff here. So in the middle of the piece, we have some chords that are blocked out. And so I might have students block out these chords. And I do this online and they'll sort of watch me make a D minor chord. And if we do something like that, you know, I'm interested in helping students identify inversions really quickly. And a little trick I figured out was using this, what I call a double alphabet. And I'll say, if we want to know what chord this is, I'll ask them what the notes of the chord are. They'll say F, A, and D. And if we're looking at the root of the chord, you know, and we're, we've probably, you know, worked on this a little bit, but they're having a little bit of trouble. I'll say, where do you see those three notes in that double alphabet where it's just every other one? And I like this idea of this little double alphabet because then it makes it a little bit easier to identify D, F, A. So it's a nice way of thinking uh, about the way inversions work and visualizing that we have to get them into kind of snowman form into every other note. Um, the middle section of Toccata Rocket presents uh, chords in all three different, in, all two, three different inversions. So you have a uh, first inversion chord in the right hand, second inversion chord, a root position chord, and then a first inversion chord. So it's a nice opportunity in the middle of a piece to review and explore that idea of inversion. Um, another thing I did, and let's go to Sea of Tranquility, is that one thing that's been a little bit of a trend in pedagogy over the last, I would say, five years or so, is people using rote pieces quite a bit more often. Uh, so I wanted to include a piece in the collection that could be taught pretty easily by rote. Uh, it uses a lot of black keys, um, but I find that it works out really, really well with students. One of the things I like to do uh, in lessons is to show students starting places, again, by using a keyboard diagram. So let me play it just a little bit in the beginning here, and you'll get a feel for what the piece sounds like. proceeds like that. And what I like, if we go back to full screen, I'll show you my next little invention. And these are the handouts that I mentioned earlier. These little PDFs I use um, to share in Zoom with students so that I have an easy way to draw on things and show them where to, where to start. And I use this diagram to show students hand positions uh, at the elementary level or when we're working on road pieces. So for example, in Sea of Tranquility, I might say that right hand starts there with right hand one. And then I might say that left hand starts here with left hand two. It's just one of those little things I've discovered in online teaching is that I like the most succinct sort of clear way of getting across an idea as possible. And so anyway, having a nice little keyboard diagram, I have found to be very, very helpful. So the next book I wanted to talk about, is I thought we'd talk about Beware the Jabberwock a little bit. Beware the Jabberwock was a really fun project for me. I've always been kind of, as you can tell by Weightless and Beware the Jabberwock, I'm kind of a sci-fi fantasy nerd. Um, so both of these were, you know, right kind of in my wheelhouse. 
And Beware the Jabberwock um, was an idea, I, I don't know, I had a long time ago just because I love the themes of it and I love the poem and I love the way it's put together. And I also thought it gave me an opportunity to write some music that kind of fit almost in like a media kind of video game world. I'm sure a lot of your students, I know a lot of mine, really get interested in video game music. Um, but video game music is made for computers and it's just, it didn't really give me the kinds of things I wanted in order to be able to teach and help my students build their musical skills. Um, so I thought, you know, I'll just write something that kind of fits in that world. And in the Wabe, which is the first piece I'd talk about, is a really good example of this. I also mentioned, I know audio quality isn't the best online. I have recorded a lot of clips of these uh, on my YouTube channel. So you can always just go search for me on YouTube and you can see like a little bit better audio quality for how some of these things sound. But In The Wave starts like this. And when I mentioned earlier that I want to find ways of writing music that kind of lives in this video game world, but gives me opportunities to teach, you know, skills that I think are valuable for pianists, this was sort of my way of teaching students about an Alberti bass figure without making it sound terribly classical. So the left hand throughout gives you an opportunity to teach an Alberti bass figure uh, without having to, you know, dig back into the 1800s and 1700s to find material for it. The um, other thing in the B section, I have kind of an idea, I always have ideas in these things about how I'm gonna teach them. And, you know, when I'm teaching students how to practice, you know, we talk a lot about balance. And usually in balance, we're talking about left hand, right hand balance. And so, you know, in the beginning, obviously, we're dealing with this idea that we want the right hand melody to sing out and the left hand to be quieter. There is a quiet section that kind of the bridges the gap in the B section where we have a little bit of a different texture. We have a chord in both hands and then a little melody that rises above. And one of the things I recommend to my students when they're playing this is I say, you know how we usually practice balance uh, and work on pieces left hand alone, right hand alone. This is a section where you can actually work on the piece harmony alone and melody alone. And it's a little bit different because of the way it's written. So I'll have students just play the, the harmony part. I like all of these chords especially like this chord. And then once students are familiar with the chords, it makes it a little bit easier for them to, you know, sort of go and find that melody. When I teach the melody, I'm always looking for ways to kind of make it um, memorable. And so the way that the melody is written, and I can put my keyboard up here also, is that you'll see that the way the melody's written, it starts with a fifth. The next one reaches higher, a fifth and another fifth, and a fifth and an octave. And I found that for a couple of my students, that really helped them memorize the piece pretty quickly, because I would just say the first one, fifth, and fourth, fifth and fifth, fifth and octave, and then an F major scale. 
So again, a lot of the material that I like to put in pieces that I write are um, things that I hope students are familiar with, things that will have a unique and interesting sound, but will also sort of transfer to other things that they're learning. The next piece I thought we'd look at is Snickersnack. Snickersnack is kind of an interesting little tune. This is sort of the, the battle scene. The Vorpal Blade goes Snickersnack, and our hero is fighting the Jabberwock. And it sounds... I just gave this to a student yesterday and we worked on it. And again, I'm looking for opportunities to teach, you know, kind of interesting uh, ideas in terms of technique, in terms of theory. Uh, in the beginning, we started by working on the left-hand part. I asked my student to identify the intervals. Um, she pretty quickly saw that they were all fifths and sixths. Once we saw that, I had her read the left-hand part. She didn't have too much trouble with it. Until we got to the third line, and then, you know, she sees this. And it gave us a little bit of an opportunity to talk about tritones, which she thought was kind of a cool sound and a wild idea. The other thing that I thought was interesting about this particular piece is that there's a fingering in the first line, three, two, one. And this is one of those fingerings that I feel like a lot of students would try to just do three, two, three, then move their hand, three, two, three, and then find that. What I told my students, like, I'm like, this is a really kind of cool trick that would be really useful to do uh, with your fingers, is to play G, F sharp, G with three, two, one. And we worked on that technique for a little bit, and it's a really nice technique because it really promotes a fluid hand position. It does, you know, it doesn't get you like stuck in place. And so I really like the way that works. And plus it has the benefit of when you go three, two, one, if you look at where your third finger is, it's ready for the next one, three, two, one. And then if you look at where your hand is, it sets you up to reach those high notes. Whereas if you're fingering with, with three, two, three, you're always having to pick your hand up and move it, pick your hand up and move it. And so I love that three, two, one trick. And plus I find a lot of that stuff is just like, you know, you have to be a little bit of a, of a salesman to your students and say, hey, here's like this cool trick. It looks cool when you do it. This little three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one. It's like, which Marx brother was it that did the funny like video on piano? It's just kind of fun to watch um, that little thing work. So I like that. Um, also the piece just has a lot of opportunities to work on staccato legato articulation, a little bit of pedal, but not too much. Um, and I also feel like it's, it's uh, you know, at a comfortable tempo. I'm always trying to look for, for uh, pretty reasonable tempos for students. But anyway, I would love for you to check out Weightless and Jabberwock. I think Charmaine might be in the background. Is this like giveaway time? This is giveaway time. Hey, it's yes. giveaway time. <laughs> So um, two lucky teachers that are um, present, that are watching here, um, will receive a copy each of both Weightless and um, Jabberwock. And we, we, um, we've been trying to figure out what the best way to do this randomly is. And let's try the first, let's try this. The first two teachers who can, who, who, who type in the chat the titles of the pieces in the Jabberwock um, book that Jason just presented will win free copies. We'll mail them out to you. Man, that's you amazing. Both, both oh, I think that's we already like, have the winner. <laughs> that's like school. So eight, so eight, <laughs> 
So Amy can will decide who was the fastest there. <laughs> and um, before we before I go back to Jason, uh, one thing we forgot to mention at the beginning is in the handouts, there's also a special treat, a PDF of a very um, popular song, Don't Stop Believing, that Jason arranged for Teaching Little Fingers um, Pop. And so that's for you to download free of charge with our compliments. And so back to you, Jason. All right, back to me. So last year we had um, our uh, fearless leader, Kevin Cranley, over at Willis had a really interesting idea about doing a storybook based on stories from the Old Testament. Called it Sacred Songs and Stories. And uh, I was one of the contributors to it. And we also have, I think, I want to make sure I get everybody. It's Glenda, Carolyn, and Randall all got to write pieces for this. And it was really kind of a fun project. It has a variety of tunes at a variety of different levels. It sort of starts with an elementary level, ends up late elementary, maybe early intermediate. But it really gave me an opportunity to kind of, you know, stretch my storytelling uh, muscles and lyric writing muscles. I tell people that the, the first piece I wrote for the book, A is for Apple, is actually the first piece I've ever written with lyrics. I've never considered myself much of a lyricist. So I had to like, it was a fun challenge. I love saying yes to things that I don't really know how I'm going to do it. But anyway, so I said yes to writing A is for Apple. And then I'm like, how am I going to come up with lyrics? And I'm like, well, I'll come up with lyrics by looking at the notes of the melody. And so if you look at how A is for Apple, works and you look at the lyrics we start out and we say a which is on an a is for adam e is for eve s is for serpent asking if you'd like a bite of a is for apple right up the tree even adam really shouldn't should have listened to me so I tried, again, it's like I'm thinking about how we're teaching this to our students. And like, if I'm teaching this kind of a piece, this is one of those pieces that like an elementary level student can totally play this and they'll totally have a great time doing it. But it's A is for apple, E is for E. And then, of course, in the B section, D is for difficult decisions. D means you don't just die down. D means you do your best to listen. B, careful or you might end up just like A is for Adam. Anyway, I thought it was a really cute way to do that. And, uh, you know, my students have kind of enjoyed it. It's a, it's a cute tune to sing. I obviously have a rubbish singing voice. so. Others can sing it far better than me. I like to pretend, though. <laughs> the other piece I wanted to talk about in here is Joseph's Dreams. Uh, another really, really nice piece. It's by Carolyn Miller. Um, and again, the teacher and me, I know that's kind of the theme of the day, is I'm always looking for opportunities to have engaging music, teach students things that they need to know. And of course, one of the things that we need to know are minor and major. And so this is exactly how uh, Joseph's Dreams works. We have this waltz-like melody that begins the piece. And in the beginning, we're in uh, A minor. We find mine. There we go. And so we begin in A minor, and the right hand I'll talk about it a little bit, but we are sort of in a variety of five finger patterns. Is the opening. When we get to the B section, she puts the same material in a major key. that. 
And one of the ways that I'll help students out is that, again, I like to use visuals when we're working in Zoom. So if the powers can be, can put me back on the screen. This is something I often do uh, on just like a blank canvas, is that when I'm teaching um, five finger patterns, I'll just do really quick circles. And so I'll tell a student, so the first part of this piece, we're in an A minor five finger pattern. The second part of the piece, we're going to move to a D minor five finger pattern. When we get to the B section of the piece, I like to get fancy and change colors. We're going to do an A major five finger pattern and a D major five finger pattern. But I like that because it's a really quick way for students to sort of visually grasp what five finger pattern I'm asking them for. Uh, you know, especially for those that just naturally are such visual learners. But it was so much easier because I remember in the beginning I would talk like, you know, a professional musician, and I'm like, so remember it's F sharp in your third finger. And that doesn't always translate really quickly, especially, you know, online. This I find looks really, really well. So at the beginning of the piece, we're in A minor, and then our right hand moves to D minor, back to A minor. back to D minor. Anyway, it's a really nice way to kind of help students out with that kind of idea. The next uh, collection I want to talk about was something that I was pretty excited to see, and I'm sure many of you have been teaching um, New Orleans jazz styles for a long, long time. Uh, it's always been a favorite in my studio. This was a popular collection by William Gillick, and thanks to the brilliance of Glenda Austin, we have a simplified version. I was so happy to see this because the Gillick, um, the Gillick original is a fantastic set of pieces, but there are some big chords, there are some complicated leaps, and so Glenda was able to get everything down to a level where it's just more accessible for younger students. Um, and of course, since Glenda, I believe, knew and worked pretty closely with Gillick, it feels really authentic. Like looking through these, uh, I didn't feel like it was a watered down version of any of this at all. Uh, the first one I thought we'd look at real quick is called the Constant Bass. It was always one of my favorites. Um, when I give it to students, sometimes they will balk at the chords a little bit because we do have some of these like quick stabs of triads that can be a little bit of a trick. But lately, you know, I find that online, uh, and honestly, it works really well in person too, is that when you break that break things down into a series of steps, it can make something like that feel a lot more um, a lot more possible. So the way that I've been making chords more possible for students, I have a lot of like elementary students right now who are starting to do triads and inversions and other chords like that. Um, so here, one of the things I like to do is teach pairs of notes. And so I'll say, let's start and let's do the uh, bottom two notes. And then I might say, let's do the bottom and the top two notes. What if we did just the top two notes? And then maybe we can try all three. Like that. Some students need a little bit more help, and even to help them find the notes, we might just do one note at a time. So I might say, let me hear the bottom note. And this also works really well online because I'll, you know, we sort of trade off doing things instead of trying to play together. So I'll say, let's hear the bottom note. I'll listen to them do the bottom note. How about the middle note? Listen to them do the middle note. How about the top note? That's always a great opportunity to talk about the little finger because it's kind of hard to use, but we get it down. 
And then, you know, we go into pairs and the full notes and things like that. But I find that slowing things down like that and putting them in a lot of steps is really useful for students. And, you know, one of the things I've noticed about teaching online is that, you know, some of my students have a lot of grit and they can really sort of push through difficult things. Um, other students, not so much. And especially when they're learning online or life is just stressful, it just gets really difficult. So we go down to those uh, those little bits. I also like working this way because it's not you know, falling back on doing everything slowly. This, you can just start right at tempo and explore that and avoid, you know, that kind of approach to starting a piece. Again, the groove of the constant bass, I'm a big fan. Um, another one I'd mention real quick is Bourbon Street Saturday Night. I'm also a big fan of Bourbon Street Saturday Night. It's just loud all the time. Fortissimo, everybody likes to play loud. Um, one interesting thing about this is it gives us a good opportunity to talk about flats. I like that you know the flats are in the score instead of being in the key signature. Again, for the level that this piece is at, uh, I find that that's really, really helpful. And I had a really interesting thing on the second page of this. I don't think we have a slide for it, but on the second page of this, there's a moment where it's an E flat in one place and then D sharp in another place. And I'm sure you've probably had students ask this kind of question where it's like, why did they do, why don't they just do D sharp both times? Or why don't they just do E flat both times? And one of the things that I, you know, have told them is, and it works in this piece really well, is like, well, they use E flat when they just want you to go to E flat. When they call it a D sharp, it's because there's an E right next to it. And when you play a step, you want it to be two different letters. And they seem to like that explanation. And I think it's kind of true too. You know, when you're writing music down, you want the music to look like what the sound is. And so if you have a sound, that's that going from like E to D sharp. You want the little dots on the page to do, 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 do that kind of thing. It's also, um, I have to say, this is a complete tangent, but I thought it was brilliant. I have occasional lessons with the four year old brother <laughs> of one of my other students, and he loves to talk about things. And of course, he asked, like, the one of the first questions we always get asked is, what is the middle pedal for? And so I got into this long explanation, thinking to myself, there's no way this four-year-old is going to get what the middle pedal does. Um, so I did it, and he looks at me, and he's like, oh, it saves it. And I'm like, what? He's like, that. yeah, if you play the notes and push the middle pedal down, it saves it. So for the last three months, Anytime anybody asks me what the middle pedal does, that's my answer. It saves it. And it's like the perfect explanation. I was so jealous that the four-year-old came up with that and I didn't. Anywho, moving right on. Um, back to New Orleans. We also have a series of duets. These are also uh, arranged by Glinda. And again, I am so looking forward to do, doing duets. Like I have a whole list, a whole little pile back here of some duets I'm going to work on when we get back in person and everybody's feeling safe. I have a couple of siblings that I've given them some duet books to play around with, but you know, I like playing duets with them too. Um, first one in here I wanted to mention was New, or uh, New Orleans Nightfall. New Orleans Nightfall, I think, has a little bit of a tricky rhythm uh, in this. If you look at this last line, the secondo part has this little bit. And that's the kind of rhythm that's like really hard to count and get the feel of it. So I don't know. I kind of had this idea of like encouraging students to like come up with words for these things. So like chord, now I'm gonna play and then it's your turn chord, then I'm gonna, you know, come up with some like some little kind of rap idea or hip hop saying, and they've had a lot of fun like coming up with some of these things. It's pretty interesting. 
Um, another thing that I like to do with difficult rhythms like this is I like to actually have them practice the wrong rhythm and count the wrong rhythm. One of the things about the rhythm, again, in the secondo part and in the primo part, is that when you're playing, there's a tendency for students to want to put that chord like on the first beat. right on that fourth beat. And it's like, eh. So what I'll have them do is I'm like, okay, let's play it on the fourth beat, but let's count it correctly. And so we'll count it out. So it's one, two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, four. And what I find is that if we have students do something incorrectly and understand exactly how to do it incorrectly, then it's easier to do it the right way. Because now that I've done it the wrong way, I can also make the choice of doing it the right way. One, two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one. And I really like that concept of like, it's not so much about getting it right. It's just like choosing the right thing from a list of options. So we might practice a couple of different versions of the rhythm. I'll do this with like much easier things also. It's like, what if this, what if this melody had a half note instead of a quarter note there? What would we do? What if these were eighth notes instead of quarter notes? And then once they grasp kind of the, the way that they're feeling it on the inside, then they gain like some ownership of it and are able to like choose the right way to do it. The other one I was gonna mention in here is the Canal Street Blues. Um, I like this one just because it sounds very Gershwin-esque. And so, you know, if students are looking to play Gershwin, of course, we don't have a lot of piano Gershwin options. We've got, you know, those three preludes, what, the novelette and F, and then everybody wants to do, you know, Rhapsody and Blue. But this really does give us that same kind of Ten Pan Alley feel. In this one, I find that, like, the trickiest little technical thing is an eighth note, or sorry, a grace note gesture. And I have a a interesting grace note thing that a, a friend of mine taught me once. And what they said is when we've got these grace notes, something like that, one, one, th one thing they said is they said, play both notes at the same time and then lift the grace note up. And that gives it such a nice crisp sound. like that. But I find that that's a really nice way to think about quick grace notes because my students, you know, they would try to play. And in a piece like this, you really want it quick like that. And this is how I think of grace notes now too. When I'm playing, it's like playing both at the same time, lift the grace note up. So anyway, I'm sure, like I said, that some of you have been familiar with these for a while. Um, definitely pick up this bit and try it out with your younger students. Uh, and if you don't know the collection, then yeah, it's fun. You'll enjoy playing these for yourself. Um, I think I can summon Charmaine again. Yes, you yes. can. Let me read I that. can. There she is. <laughs> okay, we are ready for our next giveaway, which includes um, both books that Jason just presented, The Simplified, which is the complete collection, all three books in one, of of the simplified and the duets. So this is a good, really good um, giveaway. And same thing, I want you to type in the comments uh, where, so I want the town and state where William Gillock was born and where he grew up. Let's see if anybody knows this, <laughs> maybe it's too hard. <laughs> Do you know it, Jason? No? no, I know. I I, I know where <laughs> I know the town and the state for Glenda Austin. It's close to where Glenda Austin lives. Yes. Okay. That's it's the same state. Well, I don't see anybody knowing the answer to that. That so I'm going to change my question now. Just uh, list your favorite Gillock teaching piece that you've taught in the last six months. So just the first two people who list, 
who who type their favorite Gilak teaching piece will get both books. So two to give away. For me, yeah. it would be Puppy Dog because I love Puppy Dog. It's like the perfect teaching piece. Oh, okay. Spooky Footsteps is a favorite. Oh, that one's good too. Yeah. Well, we'll if sometimes there's a little delay, so we'll wait. Why don't you continue on with the with the webinar and All let's right. see. <clears throat> Next thing I wanted to talk about, and this was so interesting. So I'm on, um, Willis has like a, a new release club that people can, can get on and I'm on it. And one of the things that magically appeared in the mail for me a few months ago was how to write a song. I mentioned earlier <laughs> that I am no good at lyrics. And so it immediately caught my eye. Um, and plus, I live in Iowa City, and so we're kind of a singer-songwriter kind of town. Um, Greg Brown is from here. We get Iris DeMent and Peter Mulvey and people like that coming through. And I really kind of dig this singer-songwriter world. Um, there are just some fantastically talented people working. And one of them, of course, is Allison James. And she wrote this, and I did not know Allison before the book came out. And then I have since looked her up. And she's got kind of a cool approach to this. So the book is actually what it says. It is how to write a song on piano. Um, there are, it's one of the few things that like, it actually gives you a recipe for doing the thing. So if you ever wanted to write a song, you just get this book and you go through the steps and you will end up with a song. A couple of my favorite things about the book is that it's step by step. I like the way the steps are organized. The first step is coming up with chords and just exploring what they are and giving some uh, suggestions for different chord progressions to use. She does start everything out just with root position triads. And then I also really like her approach to coming up with a melody because it's very close to how I write music and how I think a lot of this is done. Um, a lot of songwriting things I've seen in the past start with lyrics. And one of the difficulties in starting with lyrics is that then you have to match the rhythm to those lyrics. This book works kind of in the other direction. It starts out with coming up with a melody and she recommends playing the chord progression and then humming a melody. Like see what naturally kind of sits in your voice, like what your, what your voice wants to do as you listen to these chords and kind of imagine the emotions uh, and the vibe that they kind of, um, they, get, they give you. And the next is coming up with lyrics. Once you've got a melody, then that gives you kind of a, I don't know, kind of like the, the emotional content of the tune. And you can start to think about, okay, what words do I wanna put to this melody and these chords? The next thing, and like, as I'm going through this book, I'm like, that's such a good idea, is that she's, she's constantly asking us to revise, like try things out. And I'm like, that's such an important lesson, I think for all artists and our students, is that I've never been happy with the first version of something. And I mean, my hard drive has, I counted once, it was I think 453 sketches of pieces that I'm like not, I don't like. Um, but I think if I go back, you know, every I go back and work on them and they, then they start to gel into things. But I think a lot of songwriting works like that is that, you know, you just, you start coming up with lyrics. And it's like, eh, I don't like that word, but oh, that there's a word that's really cool. But it, it's a process that you go through. And I really like that in this recipe on writing a song, she takes us through that part of the process. The next thing I really appreciate about the book is that at the end, there's an optional chapter on notating. And she has kind of an interesting take on learning how to notate music. But if we look at the next slide real quick, you'll see that most of the book does not require um, traditional notation. So a lot of it is just using text, using blanks, and using different graphical ways of like looking at how to put the song together. There are all these things where like she'll teach a concept and then say, now this is your turn. Uh, to figure out how to put, you know, your spin on things. Um, and it's laid out like this, and you can see it on the screen. Like, 
it is actually a workbook. You can write in the book and kind of use it as a journal of putting a song together. I have to say, I have not used this with a student yet. I do have one student who I'm, as soon as we're like, she's on a little bit of a break. As soon as she comes back, this is like totally the thing that we're going to do because it's going to be right up her alley. All right. The last thing that we're going to look at today is I wanted to go through three Federation selections. I know we're kind of coming up on Federation season. And I wanted to look at three. These are three favorites of mine. Shark, which you have to say with the exclamation point. Shark is our first one by Randall Hartzell. Shark I love because, you know, everybody likes a good shark song. I started teaching this by rote to that four-year-old that uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, but one of the things I really like about it is that I've also used it with students um, to teach them how to use the metronome. If we look at the first page really quick, we have this, this sort of Jaws moment in the left hand. And of course it's the Jaws moment. But since it's just two notes and it's very easy to play, it's a great way to introduce metronome to students. You know, I don't like introducing metronome by just like turning it on and say, play with this and listen to it. I think that that's kind of difficult and frustrating for students to do. But I might, you know, just like with a piece like this say, hey, by the way, let me turn this on. How would you count and play that first part? Ta, two, ta, two. Or if we're counting numbers, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four one and two and three and four and, but it's a great way to introduce um, using the metronome. And then we'll, we probably wouldn't use it for the other parts. There is a tricky rhythmic bit on the second line. And there's a trick that I've used a lot in my teaching lately where I will have students um, like drum the melody in their lap or just on two notes. Uh, so for example, since we're playing shark, At this kind of elementary level, that is a little bit of a trick for some of our students. So I will have them, I got this from being in a marching band drum line. I do this a lot and we'll say left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, both left. And, ha and saying that out loud, this is like sticking patterns in drums. They have little L's and R's, but we'll we'll work on this. We'll be like left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, both left. And it's kind of a fun way to sort of pull that rhythm out and work on it independently. The next piece I do kind of a similar thing with. I'm so jealous of this title. I was telling Charmaine and Amy yesterday, I was so jealous of this title because it's so clever. Amingus Among Us. Uh, and of course, Mingus is Charles Mingus, jazz bassist. And if you have a student playing this piece, I would highly recommend looking for the, the tune Jelly Roll. It's on the album Mingus Am, and it really kind of fits the vibe of this particular tune. And it's a great way to kind of help students out with swing. So of course, there's this part, and you'll see it at the bottom of the first page, where you've got this bass line, but then your right hand has to do these little swing eighth notes against it. Which is super cool, um, but a little bit tricky. So what we'll do is we'll like listen to Jelly Roll and then we'll just try to tap in our lap along, just left, right, left, right, left, right, left. And we won't even try to play this until we've got that that little horse galloping kind of rhythm down. I don't break it down like, you know, that equals triplets and the other things that people do. I just like listen to it, feel the groove, left, right, left, right, left. Do, 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 do. I tell students they got to like, you know, do that when they're walking around, when they're at school, like, you know, in their Zoom classes, mute yourself, practice on your lap, do that kind of thing. When you do that, that, that rhythm comes really, really easily. And it just has such a good groove to it. Anyway, huge fan of that. The next festival thing I wanted to talk about was uh, one of the ones I wrote, 
This is run and hide. And again, this is, you know, like I was talking about with my music that I did in the beginning today, I'm always looking for opportunities to teach like a, a, a healthy classical technique with pieces that don't have a classical sound. I teach lots of classical music too, but some of my students are just not interested. So that's totally fine. So, you know, I was teaching, um, there's a, I believe it's a Wilhelm Friedman Allegro. Goes like that. And I'm like, you know, I had a student who really dug that right hand bet. And I'm like, you know, that's actually easier if it were in the left hand. And it would also be cool if it was, you know, instead of a sort of early classical late Baroque piece, if it was kind of a jazz thing. So anyway, transpose it to C minor, put it in the left hand. And it gives me an opportunity to talk about wrist rotation, a good forearm motion on that chord, all kinds of healthy classical things. And my student has no idea that they're working on classical technique. Ah, but I love it. Anyway, that's the music and all of my little rambling ideas I had for you today. I hope some of that makes sense. We'll do some questions here in a second. Um, like I said, you're welcome to those handouts. Those are just the things that I use in my online teaching. They're like helpful little templates. Check out Don't Stop Believing. I wrote it with that same kind of idea in mind, trying to give students something familiar that was in a really sort of healthy, easy, physical uh, way for them to do. So thanks very much. And do people have questions? Is there a QA and a tab? I think they do. And why don't I, I ask you, and I'll choose some we don't have very much time <laughs> but before that I, I want to remind everyone that you know you had all those pop-ups coming up um there will be a follow-up email that's sent to everyone who attended with um the discount code um and as well as everything jason presented this morning okay just so you know the discount code i believe is js20 but you will you will get um, an email that confirms that. Okay. Some artists get their name in lights. I get my name in a discount code. You get your name in a discount code. At least your initials. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Um, uh, first question: Can Jason give leveling for these books? So maybe oh, weightless. Uh, Weightless and Jabberwock were early intermediate, I believe. Yes, where the Jabberwock is early intermediate. Um, weightless is one notch easier. So it's more like late elementary, early intermediate. Um, the New Orleans jazz styles simplified are also gonna sit around there. Right. Kind of also in that, that late elementary, early elementary. intermediate world. Correct. Um, all of the... The duets, also, yeah. I mean, a I'll little say early intermediate. Yeah, I put the duets a little harder, not necessarily because of the technique involved, but just because they're duets, and you need to be really solid in your in your rhythm and being able to listen to to a duet partner. Um, Sacred songs and stories uh, has the widest range of anything I talked about today. So. A is for Apple, and I think the first piece uh, in there by Glenda, those are probably the easiest ones. I would feel comfortable teaching those um, towards the middle end of a student's first year of lessons. So it's like end of primer, level one in a method book, something like that. Um, and then the last pieces in the book, um, I would put at a late elementary, very early intermediate level. Run and high. Oh, and then the Federation uh, selections. Shark is, I don't know exactly the NFMC designations, but those are on uh, the website. You can search for those and it'll tell you like by level what all the offerings are. Um, but anyway, the easiest one would be shark. Um, the most difficult one would be run and hide and Mingus is right in the middle. Right. Okay, next question. What software are you using to make these illustrations? Oh, and those gosh. were in the 
the handout, right? Some of that. Yeah. So those yeah. illustrations are in the handout. And what you're seeing is that I'm putting those on my iPad in an app called Fourscore, uh, which is then sent to my computer. And I use this software called OBS Studio that kind of combines my webcam with my iPad with other things and I can switch around. I actually made a video and walked through my technology setup. It is very slightly out of date, but still relevant and it's on my YouTube channel. So again, if you just find my YouTube channel, um, I think that's the most recent video on it. Um, but it'll kind of walk through that. It's The good news is that the software is free. The bad news is that it's complicated. <laughs> Okay, next question from Ann Barry. Do you feel that doing certain pieces teach that inner rhythm feeling that you talked about? I do, you know, and I don't know if this, if this exactly answers your question, but one thought that I often have when I'm choosing repertoire is that, you know, some students have a stronger internal rhythm than others. And so if I have a student that doesn't really have a really solid internal sense of rhythm developed, I want to find music that has more notes in it. A good example is like A is for Apple. So when you're playing A is for Apple, the rhythm's external. You're doing all the things. Do you know what I mean? Whereas in a different piece, uh, the last piece I wrote in the book, um, Esther's Plea, uh, has a lot of half notes in it. And it's one of those things where it's like you need a student who has that internal pulse going before you give that to them. So that's kind of my my thing on internal pulse. I love it when the music like that's the consideration I have. I guess I should say it that way. I look at how the pulse is in the music. Do they need to have it in themselves or does it put it in their fingers? And then I also remember I went to a, a conference presentation once and all rhythm to some extent is based in movement. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have, I mean, literally I can reach here and have a beanbag. And so like the beanbag throwing that we do in lessons is, it happens a lot. Like I said, I have like a very short list of things that's kind of within an arm's reach. And like, that's one, the monkey's one. <laughs> the crayons, you know, it's all right here. But yeah, put it in movement. Look at where it is in the piece and play with things. Okay, next question. What music would you suggest for a 14-year-old boy beginner who is struggling with reading but wants to play cool stuff and sound more advanced? That's from Jill Jansen. <laughs> boy, that's always the question, isn't it? Um, you know, my tendency with those kinds of students is to basically like split lessons into two tracks. Like I will do um, some elementary reading and theory work with them outside the context of pieces. It's usually like workbook stuff or like flashcards I have that I use and just different things like that. And then I'll find out what kinds of things they like. It's why I write stuff like Weightless and Jabberwock. The difference is, is that I actually will just teach a lot of it by rote because um, it just gets them into it. And one of the interesting things about uh, teaching, you know, this kind of music by rote is that, you know, once a student can play it and if they have the music, then there's like an, a, it goes a different direction. And I remember being like this when I was a student, it's like, oh, I'm doing this. Oh, and that's what it looks like. So like, that's what this looks like. It's really interesting to think of reading as being in that way, instead of the notation being kind of this mystery that you're trying to figure out what it sounds like. It's like, I know what it sounds like, that's what it looks like. So anyway, that's kind of my weird answer. I will basically <laughs> teach like the same music but I'll try to go more at it in terms of like going by rote, letting them do it by ear, still have them get the book so they can see and hopefully it kind of sinks in what they're looking at, um, mm -hmm. but have it work like that. The other thing I'll say about that is that I like to find music. And again, this is one of the reasons I write the way I do. I don't do a lot of variation. 
So a lot of, especially intermediate level music, which is kind of the music that does sound cool. It's like, you know, they'll write a, a, a thing and then there's like a different variation of it. And then they kind of keep it interesting and maybe change the chords. That's really hard to keep track of if you're not a strong reader. And so I like to write things where it's like, I do this cool thing and then I do this other cool thing. And now I do the first cool thing again. And I don't have a problem with it being exactly the same. If it's cool the first time, it's going to be cool again. So right. I like it. Okay, um, just a couple more questions. Oh, this one, she's curious about what software. Go to Jason's YouTube page and he will, there's a video on there where he explains what he used yep. today, correct? Okay, last question. Can you talk a little bit about how you structure a lesson? Time warming up or and working on rep. That's from Anne Elise Ritchie. Oh, yeah. I mean, I try to keep, especially with my younger students, I keep lessons, um, very consistent. So we will always start with uh, hello and how are you doing? I really want to know where they are kind of psychologically on a given day. Um, important in person, even more important online. And then we will do some kind of warm up. Um, it'll often be from like a technique book and their method uh, in their method or some other things that we've been working on, you know, scales, five finger patterns, chords, those kinds of things that'll be in their assignment. Um, again, just to kind of get moving and to kind of remind ourselves how our bodies work and how our ears are working and things like that. Um, next, we will go into um, repertoire. And here, and I've changed this a little bit with teaching online during I don't know that by doing, oh no, did I disappear? I'm back. Some students I find are really comforted by just having the exact same steady thing to do every week. It's really nice. Like I like being a, a point of stability in their lives. And then some students, particularly the um, uh, the older students, I had a lesson two days ago where um, she had to spend 15 minutes talking about her issues with going back to school in person because our school district is changing its mind rapidly. And I'm quickly realized she's and I tried um, so hard to like get her to you know go back, but that's just one of those <laughs> things. It's trick. Oh, and the six black squares are literally just six black squares. I put them back there because a blank white wall was super boring. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much, Jason, for this amazing work webinar. And thanks everybody for being here. Again, watch your email. It'll, it'll, there'll be a wrap up of everything um, that Jason presented here. We hope to see you next time. And till then, adios and have a good day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye.